Hey, is this your first time here at City of Faith? Listen, if it is, you are one of our VIPs, and we are so happy that you connected with us today. And we would like to connect with you. So get your phone out for us. Go to your text messages, and we want you to text I Matter Here, all one word, no spaces, to 94,000. Again, that's I Matter Here, one word, to 94,000. We just want to connect with you. Yo, do you have our church app? I mean, you gotta have it. Listen, you can watch services in the app. There's a Bible in the app. There's a prayer wall where you can put in prayer requests for your church members to touch and agree and pray with you. All in the app. It's all there. If you don't have it, go to our website. There's a link to download our app. You gotta have the app, y'all. All right, y'all know we're in the middle of our ministry fair and today we are highlighting and recruiting for the media team. Listen, if you have any skills, any gifts that would help advance the work of our amazing media ministry, go ahead and jump in, get off the bench. Right now, text serve CLF to 94,000 to learn more about how you can become part of our incredible media ministry here at City of Faith. All right, y'all, don't forget, Midweek Maximize. I don't know about you, but it's one of my favorite times of the week. We will see you and you and you and you, all of y'all, online Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can catch us on YouTube or on Facebook. See you Wednesday. Hey, City of Faith, what's going on? This is Pastor D.L. Adams, your family over at Revelation City Church. And I just want to, first of all, let me just say this. I want to say thank you to your pastor, my friend, my brother, Pastor Chan, for opening up the doors of your church, your home, for allowing our church to come in and host our biannual rendezvous night of worship. Uh, this is a night that has been created and curated and designed for the worshipers, for the hungry to gather and seek God's face together. And we are so excited to be able to host this night at your church. But we don't want to just have this night at your church and not invite you. And so we want to extend a personal invitation to our City of Faith family. So if you are free, if you have nothing going on, on Saturday, February the 19th at 7 p.m., we want to invite you personally to come out and worship with us. Grab your friends, your family, grab your neighbors, your community people, grab your workers, your co-workers, grab your, grab your saints and ain'ts, and, and, and invite them and bring them on to worship with us. We can't wait to worship with you, our City of Faith family. It is a free event, um, but we just want to make sure that you do. We don't want to party without you. So once again, that's Saturday, February the 19th at 7 p.m. Come worship with us. I'll see you soon. This has been this week's announcements. You ready? Because church is back in. a good day to be in church come on y'all is it a good day to be in church let me hear from you will you just look at somebody close to you somebody you can see somebody who your voice can reach and just say the presence of the Lord is here come on I need you to tell somebody the presence of the Lord is here it's a good day to be in the presence of God I believe I believe that something special is getting ready to happen. I believe that something special has already happened because where two or three are gathered together in his name, he has promised us that he would be there in our midst. I believe that there's one thing special that the Bible tells us that we gather with the intention and the heart and the design and the desire to lift God up. He promises to drop a blessing right down in the middle of it for each and every one of us. So I just want you, wherever you are, to just take the next two, three, four seconds. And I just want you right from your spot in the room, right from your spot, wherever you are. I want you to just lift up a moment of praise and just tell God, I give you glory. Come on, I give you honor, praise, 
your God. Just for a couple seconds, come on. We, we getting ready to move on in service, but I just want you to take a moment and say, God, if you're looking for somebody to lift you up and give you praise, if you're looking for some place where you'll be glorified, here is the place. If you're looking for somebody to lift you up, here I am, Lord. You don't have to look too far. I'm here to lift my voice. I'm here to lift my hands. I'm here to use my body as an instrument of praise. I'm here to give God all that I have. Wherever you are, if that's you, just wave at me. Come on. I'm here to give God all that I have. I didn't come to church because I had to. I didn't come to church to show off a jersey or whatever my favorite team is. I came to church to give God all of me. Came to church to give God everything. So thanks be to God who gives us victory. <laughs> let's move, y'all. Let's move. Let's move. But you know, I tell y'all all the time, I love when there are waves in service. And we just tap into a wave in worship. And we just tap into a wave in the word. Our lives ought to be a series of moments in the presence of God. Our lives ought to be series of moments where we hear God, we feel God, we respond with our praise and with our worship. Mm. Let's move, let's move. You know what? I need to preach. So since I know I got to preach and, and you know, like I couldn't preach my message last week. So I'm a, let's do offering right here because I think I'm going to still be in this same vein and get stuck right up here in the middle. So, like, I know that by the time I finish preaching, we're just going to have to go home. Because, you know, y'all want to hurry up and go home and get your wings ready for the Super Bowl and all of that stuff. So, I, I just want to, you know, I just want to make sure we get right. Let's give together right here. What better extension of our worship than giving? What's a better extension of our worship than to give to the God of all creation? So right here, as we've worshiped together, as we have began to worship together, let's give all over the house. Let's give all over the house. Let's get our gifts prepared. If you need an envelope, I'm sure you may have seen our First Impressions team in the aisles and making sure if you need an envelope, of course, you can give with an envelope here in service. If you need one, wave your hand, raise your hand, and we'll make sure one comes to you. We'll make sure one comes to you if you need an envelope. DeAndre. Um, if you need an envelope, let's make sure that we are ready. Let's make sure that we are ready. So all over the house, the ways to give are on the screen. The ways to give are on the screen. We are ready. We are ready to make sure that we give God the best that we have. Amen? We want to make sure we give God our best. We never will neglect a moment to give. We never will neglect a moment to be a blessing to God. We don't come to church. I say this all the time. We don't only come to church so God can give to us. We come to give God our worship. We come to give God our praise. We come to give God our hearts. And y'all, let us also be guilty of giving God our treasure, our resources. Let us be guilty. Let us be sure that in every moment we're giving God everything that we have. Amen. And so I want to make sure that we stay faithful to the tithe. I want to make sure that we remember that the first tenth of our increase does belong to God. I want to make sure that even on a day where it's not my day to tithe, it's still my day to give. Because I put seed in the ground in every moment and watch the faithfulness of God raise up harvest in the moment I least expect it. So all over this house, I want you to join with me and so. I want you to partner with me, and so it is the seed that we sow in church that makes ministry happen. It is when we bring meat into the storehouse that God can do his work in the lives of his children, that whatever needs have to be met. God has already supplied. How did he supply, PC? Because he let us live lives of overflow. Come on. Every person living in overflow, holler back at me. Every blessed person, come on. Every person that says, my God has made sure that I live in more than enough. Not, God is not a God of enough. He's a God of, say it with me, 
more than enough. And so because your God is the God of more than enough, God has exceeded enough. That we can't shout about stuff like God is going to do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think. And not understand that God says, and I let you live that way. The goodness of God is poured out in your life so that you can make sure that my work is done in the earth. That my work is done in the city. My work is done in the community. My work is done in the lives of my children, of my sons and daughters. So all over the house, let's prepare. Let's give. Let's give. Let's give. I want to see us give. Uh, we, we know that God is faithful. We know that God is good. He is faithful when we are faithless because he cannot deny himself. It's all over. Let's get ready to sow. Let's get ready to give. Let's see God do something special in our lives. Every person that's giving and sowing in service today, even if you're giving online with your phone, I want you to stand to your feet. And I want you to hold your phone up if you're giving online. I want you to hold your seed up high. However you're giving, wherever you're giving, I want you to meet with me. I want you to join with me. I want you to be ready. Hold it up, and I want you to speak blessings over. I want you to speak blessings over your seed. Father, thank you that you're faithful. Father, thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Father, thank you that you make sure we always have more than enough. Thank you that you have supplied every need. Thank you that you have met every need. Thank you that no matter what I've needed, you've made sure that it hit my hands. Thank you, God, that you've been so good that those around me and connected to me have to be blessed because they live off of what you pour out of my life and flows out of me. That the windows of heaven are open over my life. Then you have poured out a blessing that I don't even have room to receive. So thank you, Father. It is already done. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Send unexpected increase. Send unexpected resources. Send unexpected approval where there was denial. Send unexpected yes where we had heard no before. Send unexpected miraculous possibility where there had been impossibility. And we'll continue to be faithful to you. And do what you've called us to do. And do what you've said concerning us. In Jesus' name, somebody shout, it is already done in my life. Amen. All over this house, if you're giving in service, if you're giving with the envelope in service, just come bring it. There's a receptacle here in the front. There's a, a receptacle here at the platform. Just come drop your seed. Come drop your seed. Make sure, make sure that you speak that you are blessed. Make sure that you speak that you are blessed when you sow that seed. Make sure you sow your seed. Come on, I know your team ain't playing, but hit that right there. You're good. So all over this house, there's a blessing with your name on it. Man, I'm ready to go to the Word. Y'all ready? Okay, well, I'm going to preach to the six of y'all that are ready. I just want you to know. God's going to do more than we could imagine. Not only in our lives, but through his word. So here together, let's get ready to jump into the word. I want to go right back to where we were last Sunday. Because I want to keep going through this word. I hope you, if you weren't at church, I hope you were online. If you weren't online, I hope you caught the service at some point since between last Sunday and now. Amen. I hope you're ready. I hope you got it. Because I'm just about to continue it. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going backwards because I got a lot of stuff I want to touch today. So if you missed last week, just ask after church, what was he talking about on this part? I'm just playing. We're going to be ready, though. Is it a good day? I'm going to read a lot today. Somebody say a lot. A lot. I'm going to be flipping all through this Old Testament today, okay? So so just sit down. Let's go with it. Let's go with it. If this is your first time coming to City of Faith, I'm really excited that you're here. 
If this is your first time coming to City of Faith, we're really glad that you're here. City of Faith, would you just celebrate and show our VIPs how excited you are that they are here with us today? That's sweet. Thank y'all. Y'all so sweet. Y'all so sweet. All right, here we go. Uh, First Chronicles 13, okay? I'm going to read the whole chapter because it's only 14 verses, so don't feel like, oh, my gosh, that's a long, that's a lot. It's not that much. This part is not that much, but we are going to read a lot today. You ready? When you got it, say, got it. If you're waiting on the screen, say, waiting. (laughs) The screens is there. They called up to you. All right, let's do it. David consulted with all his officials, including the generals and captains of his army. Verse 2 says, then he addressed the entire assembly of Israel as follows. If you approve and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send messages to all the Israelites throughout the land, including the priests and Levites in their towns and pasture lands. Let us invite them to come and join us. It is time to bring back the ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. Verse 4, the whole assembly agreed to this, for the people could see it was the right thing to do. So David summoned all Israel from the Shehor Brook of Egypt in the south all the way to the town of Lebo Hamath in the north um, to join in bringing the ark of God from Kiri of Jehoram. Uh, let's see, verse 5, so David summoned all Israel. Verse 6, then David and all Israel went to Bela of Judah, also called kiriath Jehoram, to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord, which is enthroned between the cherubim. Now, this is where we're going to start our focus for today, okay? Verse 7, they placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house. Uzzah and Ahio were guiding the cart. You got that? Say got it if you got it. Verse 8, David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, singing songs and playing harps, all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, cymbals, and trumpets. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark. Verse 10, Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him dead because he had laid his hand on the ark. So Uzzah died there in the presence of God. David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. He named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah as it is still called today. David was now afraid of God. And he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God back into my care? 13, so David did not move the ark into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. (laughs) Verse 14 is a good one. You'll like this. The ark of God remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom. And everything he owned. Is that good? Amen, amen, amen. Okay. For those standing, sit down. We done reading for a second. We're doing this series called Make Room. Somebody shout, make room. We've been in this series, make room, make room, make room. It is you saying, I believe God has something planned for me. I believe God has something in store for me. And because I believe that God is doing something in my life, because I believe that my 2022 is special, it is ordained by God to elevate and blow up. I'm going to make room for what I believe God is getting ready to do. It is... A moment where we say, Father, if you're bringing something into my life, let me now make room for it so that I can hold in my hand what my faith says I'll have. Right? That's, that's what we're saying when we say make room. Okay? And so uh, as, as, as we kind of walk through this text, we are in this text in First Chronicles only shown really three people, okay? Now, you got you to gotta walk with me because I, I want to walk through this text real good. I want to walk through this text real good. 
we are only shown David, Uzzah, and Ahio, really. So Uzzah touches the ark. So what we see is David assigns these two men, Uzzah and Ahio, to guide the cart that they put, uh, the, uh, they attached to the oxen to carry the Ark of the Covenant. What they did was they built a cart, uh, put two oxen on the front of it, and said, go this way. Like, we're going to put it on here, let the oxen carry the cart, and y'all just walk in front of it and guide it so nothing happens. So David assigns Uzzah and Ohio to guide the cart. And so when the Bible says they get to this threshing floor, we were there last week. We remember what the threshing floor is, yes? It is the place of separation and revelation. It is the place where that is designated for wheat and tear to be isolated from one another. And so I love how in the Bible it says it was holy ground. It was the presence of God. And so... When they got to the threshing floor, the oxen stumbled. <laughs> Whew. I, I, I can't stay right there. We stayed there last week. I can't stay right there. I can't stay right there. I got to keep moving. So, so Uzzah touches the ark because as the oxen begin to stumble, he reaches out his hand to steady the ark and make sure it doesn't fall. And when he does, the Bible says God's anger burst out against him for touching the ark. And he died right there in the presence of God. But see, we got that part of the, of, of the, the, the narrative. But we have to throw some other stuff in the mix and cross-reference some other sections of Scripture so we can fill in gaps, okay? So I'm not really a cross-reference person too much, but today I am, okay? So we're going to cross-reference a lot. So let's go right quick because I got to paint the picture and make it all make sense for you and take you all the way back through so we can circle back around and you can see why it makes sense and why it matters how we got here. So 1 Samuel chapter 7, jump with me quickly to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, verse 1 and 2 is what I want to read. 1 Samuel 7 and 1 says, So the men of Kiriath-Jaharim came to get the ark of the Lord. They took it to the hillside home of Abinadab. And they ordained Eleazar, his son, to be in charge of it. I'm trying, but I can't go if everybody don't go with me. So, 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 so the men of Kiriath-Jaharim came to get the ark of the Lord. They took it to the hillside home of Abinadab and ordained Eleazar, his son, to be in charge of it. Verse 2 says, the ark remained in Kiriath-Jaharim for a long time, 20 years in all. During that time, all Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. Abinadab is a man whose house was tasked with keeping the Ark of the Covenant. It stays in his house, the text tells you, for 20 years. Never had no problems. Nobody died touching it in his house. I'm going to mess you up. You don't see it coming, but I'm about to... Abinadab has three sons. The oldest son's name is Eleazar. And the Bible tells you in 1 Samuel 7 and 1 that he was ordained. He was ordained to cover the ark. But Eleazar has two baby brothers. And their names are Uzzah and Ahio. <laughs> so, 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 so walk with me now. Don't play, don't play, don't play, don't play, don't play. Don't play, don't miss it, don't miss it. 
I almost kicked this podium over. Abinadab has three sons. Eleazar, who's ordained to be in charge of the ark. And then his younger sons, Uzzah and Ahio. <laughs> now I have a problem, son, with the fact that the, the ark stays in Abinadab's house for 20 years. And so did Uzzah and Ahio. Yet, when we get to the threshing floor and he touches it, now the anger of the Lord is against him. The name Eleazar means help of God or helped by God. It means I have the help of God. And the Bible tells us something that's very, very crucial and critical to our lives. It is that he was ordained for his assignment. Oh, I don't want to make nobody mad. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. But if I got one problem with this 2022 church, it's that don't nobody want to go through what it takes to have the oil for your assignment no more. Oof. It, it's, it's, we all want position, but we don't want the, the struggle and the problems that come along with it. I was sitting, listening to a message my pastor preached recently, and he said something that, that messed me up. He said two things. I'm going to just preach all of his notes right now. He said two things that wrecked me. He said, he said, y'all, he said the problem with, the, with this new age church is not that we preach an incorrect gospel. It's that we preach an incomplete gospel. It's not that we preach the incorrect gospel. It's that we preach an incomplete gospel because for some reason everybody told you that what you're doing for God is supposed to be easy. Because social media told you if you belong to God, it's all good. It's all sunshine and lollipops. It's all good days and new cars and new houses and best friends and celebrations. But they never told you that there were going to be days where people would look at you crazy. And people would talk about you. And people would lie on you. And people would walk away from you. And stuff would go wrong. And you would be tricked. And you would be tempted. And you would be tested. And you would be attacked by the enemy. Nobody ever tells you any of that. And so the problem problem is we, we, we really want like all of the promise without any of the problems. Who told you you don't go through nothing because you belong to God? I would argue to you that you go through more when you belong to God. Sickness, uh, the church is not averse to sickness. Like the church is not like uh, uh, immune from sickness and disease. The church goes through the same thing the world goes through. We just have hope and a savior. You just have something to have faith in. So, so when you go through something, you get to go through it from a place that says, thanks be to God, who always causes me to triumph in his name. Thanks be to God that I am more than a conqueror. I am what he says that I am. So, like, we don't, we're not going through different stuff. The church doesn't have different circumstances than the world. The church just has hope and a savior. I'm trying. So, then he said something else that I like. He said, the other problem with the church that we find in this new age church is not just that we teach incomplete gospel, but we have people that overvalue our gifts. Oh. Oh. So everybody comes in church and says one of three things, I'm anointed. But you either got to pay me, praise me, or position me. Preach it. Preach it. Preach it. Preach it. 
in order for me to do what God called me to do, you either got to pay me, praise me, or position. Either I got to shine, I got to get a bag, or I got to be a boss. And that's why I like Obed-Edom. I done went all the way to the end because Obed-Edom stood up and said, I'm anointed for this. So while it didn't work over there, you can bring the ark to my house any day you want to. You ain't got to pay me. You ain't got to praise me. You ain't got to know my name. You ain't got to give me no positions in the temple. You don't have to do nothing. Just bring it over here because I know what's going to happen when the presence of God comes to my house. I offer to about seven people who hear me right here that what you really need to do today is go take the presence of God home with you. You need to be like Obed-Edom and say, you know what, when I get home, I got to go make room for the glory of God to be at my house. Go home and move the couch over. Go home and rearrange your room. Make some room where there was no room so you can see the presence of God show up in your life. Uh, okay, let me go back, let me go back, let me go back, let me go back, let me go back. So, so Abinadab has three sons, but only one has been ordained. <laughs> Eleazar is ordained. He has the oil. He is prepared for assignment. I want to I want to say something and I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want anybody to hear this the wrong way, but I want to I want to say it. I love this. I was listening to a talk that Dr. Jamal Bryant gave one day. And he said, I don't know why I'm right here. I'm getting stuck on the first thought. I told you, Jeremy. I told you, bro. First thought, we done. Dr. Jamal Bryant gives this talk one day, and he says, you know, here's the problem I have. Here's where I think the church lost a little bit of its oil, is that the church is the only place where you don't need any kind of training. You don't need any kind of, <laughs> you don't need any kind of certification. You don't need any kind of nothing. All you have to do is feel called. All you have to do is just feel. All you have to do is feel. If you have a dentist appointment this week, I hope that when you walk in his office that you see more than I felt called to teeth. I, that's it. I'm going to stop because cause that's going to offend somebody. I hope that when you drop your kids off at school tomorrow, that their teachers have more than a feeling of being called. But in the church, all we got to do is feel. And this text is a prime example of the difference between when you've been ordained I felt it. No, I went through it. I, I wish somebody would understand. I went through some stuff for the, God pressed me for the oil to come out. Woo! They weren't there when you was crying. They weren't there when God was squeezing the oil out of you. The only reason what comes out 
when you don't know it's in there, it's because you've been squeezed. You've been pressed. And for every person this week, I see it prophetically, that was wondering, why do words come out of me when I don't even know they were in me? When people come to me, I'm talking to six people out here. I'm talking to at least six. That when people come talk to me and say, just, what should I do? Help me with this. Like, what a, I don't know. people call you with all of their stuff. And the reason you don't even know it's in you and it comes out is because God has already pressed you. And oil comes out when it's. We want the promise without the pressing, right? You want the power without the pressing. Everybody wants to be fine. Nobody wants to work out and go to the gym and eat right. Didn't Kevin Hart prophesy? He said everybody want to be famous. Nobody want to do the work. And in the, in the spirit realm, it's no different. We want all of this stuff, but we don't want to. We don't want to go through. Oh. Can I tell you something? I don't know why I'm here. I ain't supposed to be here. I'm so far off my notes. But I'm coming back right here. Can I tell you something? When you are a trailblazer, you have to walk alone most of the time. When your assignment is to make a path for those behind you, you have to go by yourself because nobody will understand. You think about how many times you tried to tell somebody about what God was doing in your life. And you couldn't talk about it because they couldn't understand it because they ain't been anointed for it. And think about Eleazar. I'm back in your life. Think about Eleazar having to live in a house with a father and brothers who don't understand the oil and the assignment and the anointing on his life. And he just over here by himself making sure the Ark of the Covenant is good for 20 years. Standing in a house, and nobody knows, and nobody gets it, and nobody can walk with you, and nobody can do what you do, because you've been ordained for an assignment that they don't get. And so for every person right now, ooh, I hear it, God, I hear you, for every person whose heart is feeling empty. Because you feel alone. Because you feel like you have to walk by yourself. God said, do not worry about the fact that you feel like nobody can understand what I've put on you and in you. I want you to understand that what I've called you to do is be in a class by yourself. I've called you to blaze a trail. And the only way those behind you can walk forward is if you make the path straight today. So yes, you have to walk alone in some moments. Yes, you have to feel like nobody understands in some moments. But the payoff is a harvest. Oof. The payoff is a harvest of the glory of the Lord in your life. That in every season that you've sold in tears. Oh, somebody who knows the book. For every season that you've sown in tears, that the Holy Spirit says it's getting ready to come a moment where you don't have any choice but to reap joy. When you were misunderstood, it was a harvest for the glory that is to come. And I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be. Oh, all right. Oh, 
I just want you to stay strong on where you are because you've got an Eleazar anointing on your life. I don't know why the Lord, he said there's, this is a room full of Eleazars. That when you feel like you're walking alone and nobody hears you, nobody sees you, nobody understands you, I want you to get the understanding that God says, hey, I'm raising up a harvest. And if I let, uh, uh, if I let other people walk with you, they'll try to take the credit for what God did. This is not because you're smart. This is not because you're special. This is not because something's wrong with you. This is because the glory and the hand of the Lord is upon your life. And because the glory of God is on your life, it is you walking and setting forth a course that's going to change the next generation. That God has unlocked something through you. Woo! That glory is your harvest. All right, let me give you a thought. Let's go. Let me give you a thought so I can get, I got to get, oof, I got to get through it because the Super Bowl is today. Lord, I know y'all want to watch the game and see halftime and all of that, right? So here it is. You ready? Let me give you this thought. We're going to sit in this one. I don't know if I'm getting past it, but, but, but we about to do it anyway. You ready? Because the Lord just, yeah, the Lord, the Lord put me right here in this place. He just told me, sit down right there, and I will. Here it is. You ready? Thought, this is important. Take a picture of the screen, write this. We're going to make this our thought of the day. You ready? Thought of the day. Here it is. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Write this in your notes. If you're a note taker, put this down. Take a picture, screenshot your phone, do something. Maturity teaches us to learn the boundaries of our anointing. I want to make, now, I want to, I want to have that. That matters. Maturity because this is the goal, spiritual maturity. That's right. That's what we're after, right? Like, like uh, maturity teaches us to learn the boundaries of our anointing. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some things. Number one, I want you to understand um, that as a pastor, I have a role and a function in your life. I, in, in, in Ephesians. When we are introduced by the Apostle Paul to the fivefold ministry gifts, he says that Jesus gave the gifts to the church. These <laughs> Jesus, because the church belongs to Jesus, Acts chapter 20 tells us that Jesus purchased the church with his blood. Right? Like, like, like the church belongs to Jesus. Up on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Like the church belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus did not just come to pay the price for our sins. Jesus came to build his church. He built himself a home in the earth. Okay. Okay, okay, here we go, here we go. So what we understand is when the Apostle Paul introduces us to the fivefold ministry gifts, um, that one of the things we know is that the, the purpose of those was because he says, I want all the church to be unified and mature. <laughs> that the whole body would be fit together in unity and maturity. What he's saying to us is, the goal is not for you to be a baby all your life. Spiritually, I need you to grow up into maturity. I don't need your prayers to be, now I lay me down to sleep all your life. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him. Like, right? Is that how we going to pray all our lives? Okay, 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 okay. Paul says, I don't want you to stay on milk all your life. A certain point, I want you to desire meat, sincere meat of the word. I want you, oh, uh, I need you at a certain point to grow and your appetite says milk ain't enough no more. Fluff ain't enough no more. You making me feel good in a moment ain't enough no more. Man, I'm going to take a turn. God. Because at some point, at some point, Spiritual maturity has to be your portion. You with me? 
at some point, it has to be about spiritual maturity, meaning that there has to be fruit on your life. (laughs) Being a believer is about fruit. What in your life says, I belong to God? Is it only that you go to church? Is going to church on Sundays the only fruit of relationship with God in your life? Now we got a problem if that's the case. Is all there is that you go to church? There's no other fruit on your life? I know everybody just got mad. Everybody just now started having questions. Now we're introspective because we got to start examining. Man, 10 years ago, I used to cuss everybody out who made me mad. But I belong to God, and I've been going to church all this time. And 10 years later, I still cuss everybody out that makes me mad. I'm not even trying to, like, play games and stuff. I'm just trying to simply say that like that, like at some point there should be a change that comes over you. In some areas of your life, you ought to change and say like, yo, the things I used to desire, I don't desire those anymore. God has put a change in me. I used to say I couldn't stay away from certain stuff. Now, the fruit of my life is that stuff don't have a hold on me anymore. Deliverance is fruit. Breakthrough is fruit. You hear me? Freedom is fruit. It's not just that you come to church. It's that God has made a change in your life that makes you different. That's the fruit. Okay, here we go. I'm I'm, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I don't know why I had to get that out. Maturity teaches us to learn the boundaries of our anointing. Watch this. You probably look up here and say, why are there so many lights and stuff on the platform? And I'm going to show you why. Because it is a boundary. (laughs) It is a boundary. Light is directed to where I'm supposed to be. It helps me know that when I'm no longer in light, something changes about me. I become much harder to see. Now, if I try to preach my whole message from right here, I'm much harder to see now. But when I come back over here into a lit area, I recognize my boundaries. Maturity teaches us to know that we have boundaries. I can't preach from right here. Right? I can't preach right here because can't nobody see me. Because cameras don't reach over here. You understand what I'm saying? So now when I come back up here, it makes sense. Because I'm in a better position. When you were little, you had boundaries on your life. You would say, Mama, can I go outside? And what would she say? Don't leave our street. Stay in the backyard. You can go to this friend's house. You can't go to that friend's house. You had to be back in by a certain time. There were boundaries in your life that kept you safe. And I want you to understand that many of us, because we're not mature enough in our assignment, I'm going to turn around this way so you can't, because you don't think I'm talking to you. Because many of us are not mature enough in our assignment, we don't realize the boundaries of our anointing. And so we think when our leader tells us no, he hating on me. Y'all know how many days 
I called and asked my pastor something, and he said no, and I was like, oh, okay. Never mind then. Like, understand what I'm saying. Maturity teaches you to learn the boundaries of your anointing. And what I'm saying to you is, a lot of people got messed up because they thought that because, <laughs> oof, this is, this is going to sound petty. It's not petty. Say it's not petty. I'm not being shady. I'm like being serious, but this is, a, this is like real. Because so many people, you, you, you've probably seen it, you can attest. Because somebody preached at church. And, and, and four people said, amen. And told them, yo, that was such a good word. You blessed me. They encouraged you. And then two weeks later, I feel God calling me to step out on my own. We back to that word, I feel. It's a dangerous game. Because maturity teaches you to learn the boundaries of your anointing. You can be called to teach and not called to pastor. All teachers are not pastors. All teachers are not shepherds. You might be good at singing. You might not be anointed to lead a ministry. Maturity teaches you to learn the boundaries of your anointing. And if I can give you one thing, Dr. Darius Daniels preaches often. I love it's one of the greatest leadership lessons I've ever learned in my life. He has this rule called the five P's. Properly placed people prevent problems. Properly placed people prevent problems. Properly placed people prevent problems. Problems. Sometimes the problem is not that you ain't anointed, just not in the right place. You might have oil, but you're not in the right place. Wrong position. Properly placed people prevent problems. You're great. You're just not great right there. You're great over here. And maturity teaches us to learn the boundaries of our anointing. If you can't cook, why do you want to be on the cook? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, Your kids don't even eat your food. And you want to come to church talking about, ooh, I just. <laughs> I'm not talking about nobody. We don't even have a cooking team at our church, so I ain't talking about nobody. <laughs> like, <laughs> What? Properly placed people prevent problems. If I tell DeAndre right now, go to the keyboard and put me in the key of E. We, we got to, that's why I said it. Because in his mind, oh, that's my key. You don't know how to play, sir. Why well, you got a favorite key and you can't play? You understand what I'm saying? But we get into the wrong place because maturity hasn't taught us the boundaries of our anointing. So sometimes we pick up more than we're supposed to carry and then get mad at God. Why is it so hard, Lord? I didn't tell you to do that. I anointed you, but with boundaries. Stay on your street. Stay on your street, player. You went off around the corner into the neighborhood. Y'all don't understand, like, when I be preaching on Sundays, I be saying stuff like, hey, I just pastored this church. I can only talk about what this church, I can, I can only say what God said for this church. I'm not out here trying to tell the whole world what, what like, that ain't my anointing. I'm a shepherd. Right? 
I never said I'm an apostle and an evangelist and all of that. I'm not all of that. I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. I am called to lead you and push you closer to Christ. That's it. I ain't praying for the Lord to give me a word that to preach to the people in Japan. I ain't over there. Let me stay on my street. I'm on Wichita and Rodeo. You, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes we get messed up because mature, we're not mature enough to recognize our boundaries. I'm trying my best. What they used to say in church, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Why do people say that? Hello, lights and walls. <laughs> so, so maturity teaches us to learn the boundaries. Maybe you're not called to be over it, just in it. Be good being in it. You don't have to be over it, just be in it. Maybe you can only do one Sunday a month, not every Sunday. Hey, stay in your boundaries. Maturity teaches you to learn your boundaries. It's not that you're not anointed, but we get messed up when we get outside of our boundaries. Eleazar has been ordained. His brothers know this, but they don't speak up and say, hey, man, that, that ain't for me. That's not my oil. You get it? So Eleazar, for 20 years, in the same house they've been in, us has been right there. His bedroom was across the hall. My room right here, your room right there. Right? It's my brother. He knows what I do. He knows I've been ordained. He saw me. And yet, after 20 years, when David showed up and said, Uzzah, come guide the cart, he did not speak up and say, it's not my, <laughs> it's not me, it's not on me, it's not, it's not my juice, it's not my oil, it's not my lane, that's my brother. We together? Because maturity teaches you to learn the boundaries of your anointing. It's not to say that Uzzah wasn't anointed. You just weren't anointed to do this. What we pull from the text is that David goes to the right house and gets the wrong people. I'm trying to be done, y'all. David went to the right house. Wrong people. He goes to get the sons of the man who held the ark and tells them to move it. But there's two tensions in the text that we've got to examine. David chose the wrong son. The two who were chosen were not assigned to the ark in their father's house. If they weren't watching the ark in their daddy's house, why do you think they can watch it out here? <laughs> Somebody called me recently and said, hey, can y'all's church uh, come sing at a thing? I said, let me, hold on, let me stop you right there. I don't, I ain't involved in no singing and who does what and what, because listen, because I don't, I'm not going to say yes because I'm not coming. <laughs> <laughs> All I can do is point you to the people who are over that. If they want to go, cool. Not me. I'm not going to say yes for something that I'm not assigned to. I don't sing in direct choirs and stuff. I'm not doing any of that. I do this. Uzzah and Ahio. Second tension in the text we got to examine. And I'm going to be done, I think. Maybe. Games at 530, we got a couple hours. <laughs> I'm just playing. 
Everybody's going to get them church fingers and walk off. Uzzah and Ohio had 20 years to see the ark cared for, and they still didn't get it. You, you know what I'm saying? 20 years they lived with it and saw how it was cared for. And guess what? They still didn't get it. Because can I tell you something? Another note I'm stealing from my pastor. I can borrow it. That's spiritual sonship. Because if you don't sound like your leader, never mind, that's another thing. I'm not, we're not talking about sonship today. Oof. Some things are taught and some things are caught. Oza and Ohio do not catch. They don't catch it. They have 20 years. To see the ark cared for. They had 20 years to see the ark cared for and they missed it. <laughs> the issue with this, the issue that I have with this is that David spent his whole life being overlooked. Man, oh, that's all. Ugh. I don't have time. But can I go back prophetically? Can I go back prophetically to when I told you for every person who's blazing a trail, you have to walk alone sometimes? Please remember that when God tells Samuel to go anoint the next king, he goes to Jesse's house, who is David's father, and he says, one of your sons is the next king. And his father invites all of his other sons except David. He was supposed to know, G-Mama. What do you do when the people around you can't see? What do you do when the people who are supposed to hold you can't see you? David spent his life being overlooked. When David fights Goliath, it's on accident. David was not even old enough to go to war. And David goes, watch this, watch this, watch this. This is crazy. I love this story. Because David is sent by his daddy to the war to go take food to his brothers. The only reason David was there is because he said, go take this food to your brothers. They're at war. And when David showed up, he sees Goliath terrorizing the people. Everybody was afraid to fight him. He had just been destroying people, and Goliath has now been called the champion because everybody's afraid to fight him. And David comes in and says, why y'all scared of him? I'll fight him. And they say, no, David, you can't fight him. You're too little. You're too young. Go back home. He's been overlooked his whole life. The most anointed man in Israel. The one that God uprooted Saul for. And yet, when it's time for him to pick who's going to move the ark, he can't see who to call. Not the one that's been overlooked, not being able, not the one that couldn't, that hadn't been seen, not being able to see. Not that David was unseen and then comes in here and can't see Eleazar. Y'all got me? Not that you're the guy who watched everybody else get picked around you when you were really knowing that you were the pick. <laughs> and then when it's time for you to pick, you don't know who to pick. Some things are taught. Some things are caught. Proximity does not guarantee oil. Proximity does not guarantee oil. Just because you're close doesn't mean you have access to the oil. Come here. Preach the rest of the message. Proximity 
does not guarantee oil. But he could look at my notes. But he was on the platform. But he was in the lights. But maturity says, I recognize the boundaries of my anointing. He can put on my glasses. He can read my Bible. He can use my notes. But proximity does not guarantee oil. I'm going to stop. I'm done. Let me give you this last thought right here. I'm going to give you one, one thought on the way out. I'm going to be done right here. Y'all just got to come back to church next Sunday. I'll keep preaching. I mean, because listen, don't, don't, <laughs> don't be disappointed that I'm stopping right here. We'll be here next Sunday, too. We don't close. <laughs> we open on Sundays, big dog. You know what I'm saying? Like, Open Sundays at 1030. Okay. Here it is. You ready for this, this last thought? We can be in the right house with the wrong oil. We can be in the right house with the wrong oil. Right? We see people who have every opportunity to see what God is doing and learn the assignment, but they never catch the revelation. Right? It's, it's, it's a thing. Uh, you can be in the right house. Uzzah and Ohio were in the right house. But they were not ordained because only Eleazar was ordained to carry the ark. <laughs> right? something in my spirit right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read two pieces of scripture, then I'm going to be done, and I don't have to preach. I'm not, I, don't, I'm, I don't know. Let me read these two pieces of scripture, and I'm done. Exodus chapter 25, right quick, and I'm going to read through this super fast because it's like 15 verses, and I don't, I don't, you, we don't need all of it, but I'm going to read it so it makes sense because I need to read Exodus 25, and then I need to read two verses in Deuteronomy right quick. Okay, because I just want you to leave with a complete thought. I guess that's what, that's what, that's what I need. I don't want you to leave incom with an incomplete thought. But I, I, I believe we've got it in our spirits, right? Like maturity says there are boundaries to my anointing. I have to stay where God has called me. It's not my role to do everything. I have to do what God said concerning me. And sometimes it's as simple as knowing what God says before we go. And too many times we move without knowing for sure. Wait till you no know before you go. Exodus chapter 25, let me read, I'm going to start at verse 10, okay? A and these are instructions that when God speaks to Moses about the Ark of the Covenant, he says, this is how I want it built. This is what I want for the Ark. He says, have the people make an Ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, 27 inches high, overlay it inside and outside with pure gold, and run a molding of gold around it. Cast four gold rings, then attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Watch this. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the Ark and carry it. Verse 15, Those ca these carrying poles must stay inside the rings. Never remove them. 16, when the ark is finished, place inside the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. 17, then, makes the, then make the ark's cover. 
the place of atonement from pure gold. It must be 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. Then make two cherubim from hammered gold and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover, making it all one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover with their wings spread above it. They will protect it. 21, place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. 22, I will meet you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that, ho that hover over the ark of the covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. God gives such specific instructions for the ark of the covenant. And he says, I gave you these because I'm showing you where I want to meet you. And sometimes we're asking God to meet us when we haven't done what he asked us to do. He told you, this is where I'm going to sit. Build my seat. Okay. So we have the instructions for the ark. But then God goes as far as to specify and ordain who's responsible for the ark. He says, Abinadab is of the tribe of Levi. And Eleazar is his son, which qualifies him through lineage. Let's go to, go to Deuteronomy right quick. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Let's read verse 8 and 9. You ready? At that time, the Lord set apart who? The tribe of Levi. To do what? To, to, whoa. To do what? Carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And to stand before the Lord to minister to him. And to bless in his name to this day. That is why the Levites have no share of property or possession of land among the other Israelite tribes. The Lord himself is their special possession. I just wanted to say this because I'm talking again prophetically to every person who's blazing a trail. And you feel like you're alone. He showed you the tribe of Levi. He said, I gave every other tribe of Israel. I gave every one of the other tribes of Israel a piece of possession and property and land. And I didn't give it to them because I'm their possession. I set you apart for me. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to care the Levites were assigned to carry the ark of the covenant and I just want to offer to you ooh, that the Lord said I already had a plan long before you got here I had already spoken I spoke in Deuteronomy I spoke in Exodus I spoke to your forefathers I spoke to Moses who is dead by the time David moves the ark. He wrote it down. But you didn't know what I said. Because <laughs> you didn't know the boundaries of your anointing. I'm done. Let's stand. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. I pray for such spiritual maturity and growth over your people now that in this season, in this moment, we will be able to look and say, I, I am so much closer to God than I've ever been. That every day I feel myself growing closer to my heavenly father. That every day I feel God pulling me closer. And doing more and more in me. So thank you, God, that in these moments we can step into your house and into your presence and you'll speak to your children like a father does. God, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We let our hearts, let our hearts be focused on you. 
And every day, even this week, every day this week, I just want to pray and ask you, Father, to speak to us in such a special way that we would hear you, that we would be encouraged, that we would see you high and lifted up, that we would see your glory be revealed in us. In the name of Jesus, lift up every hung down head. Encourage every person who's discouraged. Reassure, reaffirm every person who feels lonely that they are not alone. Push us further into assignment and purpose now that we would fulfill your will for our lives and know that harvest is waiting on us. In the name of Jesus, thank you. It's already done. And God, we make our hearts open for you to have your way in us. In the name of Jesus. Somebody just lift your hands right there and just say, God, I surrender to you. Come on, God, I'm surrendered to you. Hallelujah. I'm surrendered to you. You can have all of me. You can have your way in me. In the name of Jesus. We bless your name. Help us to be mature enough, God, to see the boundaries of our anointing, to know what you've said, what you've called us to, what you want from us and for us. And we'll stay right where you put us. In Jesus' name, we say thank you. We love you. We are yours. We are here for you and every person who is fully submitted to God in this moment and says, God, you have all of me. You have your way in me. I want you right where you are to just say, thank God and amen. And it's already done in my life. Come on, give him glory right there wherever you are. <laughs>